For Aventru and Silai, the name Agatha Steric summons images of nihilistic, gleeful terror. Anarchs as a wave of destruction, demolishing everything in its path. But for the neonate Anarchs living under the arbitrary and cruel rules imposed by that same Ventru, she's the very personification of revolution as revenge. Who cares if we're going to live another night? Let's tear these bastards down right now. More ideological and principled Anarch leaders tend to despise Steric because of her practice of diablerie and lack of interest in any utopian cause. For them, she's nothing but a monster, little better than the creatures of the Camarilla. Yet their perspective might be tainted by the power they wield, because Steric does have one single principle. She always punches up, usually literally. She's famous for turning on her friends and allies in favor of a mistreated ghoul or suffering human. For all their dislike of Steric, few Anarch leaders really want to make a move against her. Deep in their unbeating hearts, they too appreciate the idea of a monster of their own, a joyous terror giving the Camarilla something to be afraid of. The less power you have, the more hope Agatha Steric gives you. Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to Our World of Darkness and another episode of Metaplot Monday. And right now we're going through the Anarch Guide for the Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. And uh, we're going through the lore sheets, and right now we're covering Agatha Steric, who is actually a character I personally have never heard of. And uh, I do plan on going into a little bit more information about this character as we go along, um, but what her lore sheet gives you um, is, is actually kind of interesting. She is one of the big things that makes me think that the Anarchs have no true um, survival basis because there are individuals like this in that and there's no power structure keeping them in check. And uh, I, I might get some enemies on this one. I mean, right now I'm running an Anarch game, but the idea that the Anarchs can just have free reign to do whatever they want really does put aside the idea of the Masquerade after a little while. And that is one of the things that I really try to get through in my games, because we're, we're running off as if the Anarchs are heroes on this one. But in truth, when we're talking about Vampire the Masquerade, there are no heroes. We're talking about monsters no matter which side you're on. So do you want to be part of the organized monsters of the Camarilla who, yeah, they don't get a fair shot at things because they're under someone's boot. Do you want to be unwieldy crazy monsters who are waiting for some dark god to show up after millennia of disappearing and trying to fight off other gods like the, of the, like the Sabbat are because they're, they're kind of screwed too. Or do you want to be part of this freedom-fighting, justice-for-all group of monster hypocrites that the Anarchs truly are? Because there is no equality when it comes to vampires and humans. There is no equality when it comes to vampires and vampires most of the time, but they're, they're fighting for it. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And the perspective of the vampires who look at Agatha in their own ways, whether or not she's a, uh, a shining light for the Anarchs to pump fear into the Camarilla, or whether or not she's a monster in and of itself because she practices Diablery, which is considered on all accounts the most heinous crime you can com commit in Canite or Kindred society. She's cannibalizing and justifying it. And it really brings into the, the, the whole mindset of what is chaos to the fly is normal for the spider. And it really does come to play in that kind of thing. Because how humane can a character such as Agatha Steric truly be, 
even though she's the one fighting for humans and ghouls' rights above her own kinds. Now, jumping on to the unofficial White Wolf Wiki, where I, where you all can get a good majority of a lot of information that you're going to get about Vampire the Masquerade and the way that it works and the details on characters and stuff like that. Uh, it literally just says, More ideological and principled Anarch leaders tend to despise Tarek because of our practice of Diablery, blah, 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 blah. It's literally just what I just read. That's all that's there. Now, for a little bit of tri uh, trivia here, we do have that she is indirectly responsible for the foundation of the, and I'm going to butcher this because it's a Polish word, Ostewola Cella is, is what it is. It is O-S-W-O-B-O-D-Z-I-C-I-E-L-E, -E, and that is the closest way that my mouth is allowing me to pronounce it after looking up several pronunciation guides on this one but to just give you a little bit of a background on what that is in the wiki it says that that it is simply the o uh, is a ghoul organization with some kindred sympathizers operating within the anarchs uh, their goal is to liberate ghouls held by the blood bond uh, especially targeting anarchs who they think are hypocritical for keeping thralls. So that is a very cool little bit of information about it. Uh, it says that she was present in Paris during the May 68 riots, uh, where she embraced her first three children, uh, only one who survived the event, uh, and that also she's a Bahari. So that's cool. She's a worshiper of Lilith. Um, a little bit more uh, to know for you is that she... Um, is uh, she was embraced before 1968 uh, her clan is unknown her generation is unknown and she has at least three childer um, and her alliance is anarch that is literally the only thing that I could find on the wiki itself but uh, trying to find other information about her is not easy um, I'm sure if you dug around on reddit and stuff like that you might be able to find some things um going through all of this stuff i have been able to pretty much just find the exact same photo of her over and over again so this is one of those characters that's just like so new to the world of darkness um that they don't she doesn't really have that much lore yet other than this lore sheet itself which I mean, she seems like such a fun, cool character. And if any of you know of a place where I can find better lore on her, I'd be very, very uh, appreciative. Because getting the information out to you guys is really what I'm trying to do here. And if I can't find it myself, I can't do that. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at what this lore sheet offers you. Investing one trait into Agatha Starrick get you terrorizing the powerful like agatha you have an uncanny ability to strike terror in the hearts of licks more powerful and influential than you once per story you can re-roll an intimidation test when confronted with a lick of greater means than yourself this can mean age resources or sect status but the final call on whether your ability applies is up to the storyteller. So, for the most part, this is all about situation, in my opinion. As a storyteller, if I was talking about how you would be able to use this, it would really depend on the person you're trying to use it on. If you were trying to use this against an influential ventru then the sex status or or resource level might apply for your intimidation if you're trying to use this on a torridor popularity or sex status could come into play this is definitely going to be dependent on the npc or the spc as the storyteller sees fit i can see where this can come in handy obviously though because this is a character that's based on intimidation investing two traits into this lore sheet gets you apprentice you've met agatha steric personally and something in you caught her interest 
Sometimes she sends you little tidbits of information about weakness and private vices of a powerful lick in your city. Often with the aim to allowing you a taste of their sweet, sweet blood. Once per story, you gain the equivalent of four dot contacts for the purpose of deducing a weakness in a stronger enemy. This could be anything from their feeding habit, their touchstones, or the flaw in their haven security. This right here is pretty cool. I, I cannot deny that. Apprentice is one of the things that I think would be really, really nice. But as you can see here, it does say that this very well might have to do with the aim of you eventually tracking down and diablerizing this individual. That can be kind of nuts because this is a double-edged sword. There's no telling if the if you're playing an Anarch, if the Baron in your area, or even if your own Coterie is going to be accepting of those practices. Diablery is something that really does not need to be considered commonplace. It does not need to be considered something that just people do. It should be secretive. It should be dark. It should leave everlasting. It should make you terrified that somebody's going to look at you with, with, with soul scry. It should make you terrified that somebody's going to come up to you with, with a taste for blood and figure something out. This should give you. I, I really wish there were paranoia points, kind of like the, uh, kind of like the, 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 the Lovecraftian Call of Cthulhu games, where you, where you start having insanity build up. I really do wish that paranoia was an access to this because it really does make sense when you're talking about getting into committing diablery. Now, of course, this does not necessarily just have to be diablery, but I can see that being a really commonplace factor when you're dealing with Agatha because she does not want that blood to go to waste, apparently. She wants you to become more powerful. But if you become more powerful, how is this going to help you later on when you run out of vampires that are stronger than you to actually intimidate. Investing three traits into the lore sheet gets you a favor ode. You've met Agatha Sarek once or twice, perhaps in a delicate situation involving murder and the spilling of Camarilla blood. Because of your shared history, once per story, you can cash in on a bone someone in your city owes her, a known appreciator of Vitae, the boons owed to Steric always involve gaining access to a particular type of vampiric blood. You explain what kind of blood you need, and the storyteller tells you who owes the boon to acquire it. Limited by what's possible in the domain. For example, Methuselah blood is probably not possible, but the blood of the prince might be. So, again, this is all about blood. Not necessarily Diablery, but the acquiring of blood itself. It's a couple of traits here and there. Possibly used for some obsessimus uh, Tremere rituals or something like that. Or being able to hold it over someone or to sell it or something like that. Like, there, there, this right here is going to take a lot of back and forth of imagination on how you plan on using it. Because blood, blood is a sensitive subject, and it really should not be something that gives no value like it needs to be something that's 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 built up this also comes to mind uh the the rule on how if you want to use the blood for blood bonding and things like that it has to be directly from the vein i don't really see how a lot of the ideas that i have for this lore sheet can be used if that rule is hard and fast um now in my games the way that we do it is that vampire blood stays good outside of the body for an hour. Um, the When you hit uh, older, more powerful vampires, either blood potency or generation, it may last longer depending on how old it is. And when you get to Methuselah blood, it ends up being something it, that if it's, if it's properly kept, can actually stay good for a lot longer. Hence the concept of Zapathosura's blood being an Andaluvian blood that's still active even after he's been dead since 1999. Uh, that kind of thing is, uh, that, that, that really can be a hindrance on what you plan on doing. And I'm, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on blood. In fact, maybe next Monday we need to discuss blood. 
in general and how it can be kept and stored and and used for Metaplot Monday. I think that'll be fun. Investing four traits into this lore sheet gets you unlikely allies. Steric is a figure of hope for many who no longer believe that the better world is possible. They are content to yearn for revenge, and like her, you've become to seem like someone who could make things difficult for the powerful. Because of this, once per story, an obsessed servant or minion of your undead enemies will help you in a tight spot as long as they can do it without getting caught. The storyteller can make this happen, or you can appeal to a minion with a persuasion roll with four additional dice. Four additional dice in a persuasion roll against somebody's servant who could easily sneak into somebody's house during the daytime is actually pretty disgusting. Um, and as, as fun as this sound, it really does make me think of the idea of just two dimensional SPC enemies. Like the prince. Who is the prince? What does the prince do? Does the prince have a life outside of being a prince? Does he treat his minions badly? These are the kind of things that bring into my mind. I, I just, I don't know. As much as this is fun, I do see it being very limited on building story. And maybe I just go too, too detailed. But like, when, and I'm going to go back in uh, a, a good a good example of this is when uh, uh, Billy Smith became Prince in my game. The Billy Smith that everybody knew and hated was a law was a one-dimensional, power-driven. I'm gonna be Prince, but for what gain? Character. He really did seem two-dimensional and and bad. He did not have Anarch goals at heart, even though he was Bruja. He was still supporting the Camarilla. He he really did seem to be more in it for himself than anything else. As soon as everything be uh, began to calm down and Billy Smith actually did become Prince, the first thing that he did is reach out to an observed Anarch leader. Somebody that he could talk to. Somebody who he considered family. He reached out to Tinia and invited her to a place where they could meet in private without being overheard by Camarilla or Anarchs to talk to her where he she got to see a different side of him how humane this character was because he was trying to keep the city safe for family it makes it difficult when you find out that the person you've been fighting against has a soul it makes it difficult when you find out that this person may actually be more than just a cardboard cutout vampire bent on supernatural supremacy. And this right here kind of... I mean, it doesn't mean they don't have unsatisfied minions. And I think that is really something to, to take in consideration that not everybody is going to be happy. It's another, it's another situation of spy, uh, spider and fly. Um, what's chaos for one is, is the regular for the other. It's survival for the other. So, yeah. Take into consideration with that. Try not to make cookie cutter characters. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. This isn't supposed to be a, uh, a, a storyteller you know, advice section. This is supposed to be looking into a lore sheet. So we'll get back to that. Investing five traits into this lore sheet gets you the joy of transgression. Akata Steric argues that diablerizing powerful Camarilla vampires is not only an anarch responsibility, it's also one of the chief joys of the revolution. You've taken her words to heart and no longer suffer an automatic loss of a point of humanity when diablerizing someone with more sect status than yourself. However, the potential humanity loss from when you roll the effects of the Diablerie can still apply. So, just in case nobody knew this, when you commit Diablerie, you lose a humanity trait. You also receive stains 
from committing the Diablery, which could lead to additional losses in humanity. So you can actually lose more than one point of humanity in a Diablery. Now you always lose a point of Diablery unless you've taken this and then it depends on the status of the individual because obviously if they have more status in the Camarilla than you have in the Anarchs, well man, that means they must be worse than you. It really is such a, an interesting perception because it's like, yeah, I might be a monster but I'm fighting for human rights. At least I'm not like this guy in the hum in the Camarilla. But the guy in the Camarilla over there is like, at least I'm keeping the Sabbat out of town. It, perception is so manipulated. It's such an interesting character all, all the way through. And I really hope that somewhere out there, and I just haven't been able to find it, there is more lore on Agatha herself. Because this is a character that you could throw into your games and have it really just screw things up, especially if the Anarchs are the ones on top. If the Anarchs are fighting the Camarilla out, or if there's some kind of peace treaty or something given, this is the wrench that can be thrown in the works that will completely destroy that part of the story, adding drama. Because now you're fighting against, as Anarch characters, this monstrous character who's coming in to just destroy. You've worked for your utopian peace, but that's not enough for Agatha. If they're not dead, then it's not over. They're not... If, if Agatha herself is not flossing elder vampire out between her fangs, then the job has not been completed. And then there's the, also the fact that some of your player characters might actually support Agatha. And want the ability to do this. You get to really have the war of self when it comes to introducing this lore sheet and the character that it represents. Because this is truly a story of personal horror. When you are making a list of justifiable murders simply because the people that you are fighting against have different viewpoints than you do. I am Voivode Maquette. This is Our World of Darkness, and this has been a close look at the mysterious Agatha Steric and what she believes to be the way the Anarch cause should go. I'm very interested in hearing how you think the Anarch cause should go concerning her viewpoints. Thank you for joining me. Good evening.